Two hours ago, Donald Trump said that he had, quote, a great conversation with President Obama today. Those were his words, great conversation. And that he also said that it was, quote, a very, very nice call, end quote. That was an upgrade from very nice conversation, which was what Donald Trump said about the phone call three hours earlier at 5 p.m. Florida time. By 8 p.m. Florida time, very nice conversation became very, very nice, twice as nice, which wouldn't be very surprising and would be consistent with Donald Trump and President Obama's descriptions of their interactions since the election. But what makes it a bit surprising today is that Donald Trump's first public statement of the day at 9.07 a.m. was a tweet saying, doing my best to disregard the many inflammatory President O statements and roadblocks, thought it was going to be a smooth transition. Not. No one has any idea what Donald Trump was talking about in that tweet, because when he was asked to elaborate on it in his first exchange with reporters today, in the middle of the afternoon, he completely contradicted his own tweet. Mr. President, you tweeted this morning that um, the transition of power wasn't going smoothly as it relates to President Obama. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is it, is it going smoothly? Oh, I think very, very smoothly. It's very good. You know what I mean? Donald Trump's staff refused to clarify the tweet, and in Donald Trump's three brief chats with reporters at Mar-a-Lago in Florida today, it was as if the tweet had never happened. Did you speak with President Obama today? I did, I did. Uh, he phoned me, we had a very nice conversation. Did you bring up any of your concerns about these roadblocks? We had a general conversation. Uh, I think the Secretary's speech really spoke for itself, but we had a very general conversation. Very, very nice. Appreciate it that he called. Now, that seemed to maybe indicate that President Obama's phone call was about Secretary of State John Kerry's speech today about Israel. That is the only thing that Donald Trump actually refers to when he's answering that question about the phone call, but he doesn't specifically say that that's what they talked about. In Donald Trump's final appearance tonight, reporters tried to get a clarification. Yeah, he called me. He called me. We had a very, very good talk about, generally about things. He was in Hawaii. And it was a very, very nice call. And uh, I, I actually thought uh, we covered a lot of territory, a lot of good territory. Are you satisfied with the transition this far? Well, our staffs are getting along very well. And I'm getting along very well with him, <laughs> other than a couple of statements that I responded to. And we talked about it and smiled about it. And nobody's ever going to know because we're never going to be going against each other in that way. So, but he, he was, uh, it was a great conversation. A president-elect's days have always been intense cramming sessions of studying policy briefing books, meeting with policy experts, and trying to staff a government with literally thousands of presidential appointments. And so no president-elect in history has ever used a single minute of that time to meet with the likes of Don King until tonight. Hello, everybody. Everybody okay? Yeah, great, thank you. You don't know Don King? Of course. Who doesn't know Don King? It's just great to be in America. And now with our leader, we're going to make new day. Make America great again. Does Donald Trump believe that there is a human being anywhere on Earth who thinks meeting with Don King is the indication the world has been waiting for? That Donald Trump is now taking his new job seriously enough? It's the same Don King who has done time for killing a man, the same Don King who's been accused of stealing millions of dollars from boxers he has promoted. The Trump team had announced that Donald Trump would make a major speech today about the economy and jobs, it turned out to be a one-minute statement in which Donald Trump tried to take new credit today for some jobs that were already announced weeks ago. Here now, in its entirety, uncut, is Donald Trump's major announcement about the American economy and jobs today. Hello, everybody. So we just had some very good news because of what's happening and the spirit and the hope. Uh, I was just called by the head people at Sprint, 
and they're going to be bringing 5,000 jobs back to the United States. They're taking them from other countries. They're bringing them back to the United States. And Massa and some other people were very much involved in that, so I want to thank them. And also, OneWeb, a new company, is going to be hiring 3,000 people. So that's very exciting. So we have a combination of Sprint for 5,000 jobs, and that's coming from all over the world, and they're coming back into the United States, which is a nice change. And also, OneWeb, 3,000 jobs. That's a new company. And it was done through Massa, and a terrific guy, and we appreciate it. Okay? Joining us now, Howard Dean, former chairman of the Democratic National Committee and an MSNBC political analyst. Also with us, Jonathan Gruber, professor of economics at MIT. He is one of the primary architects of the Affordable Care Act. And uh, Howard Dean, uh, Donald Trump didn't mention that earlier in the year, Sprint had cut 2,500 jobs. And so these 5,000 that were already announced, and Sprint confirmed tonight that these there's nothing new uh, in what Donald Trump was uh, announcing today as his major economic announcement. Uh, and if you really want to do some, you know, math that includes the net effect of Donald Trump in the jobs world, you'd have to begin by the thousands of jobs that were lost in Atlantic City through the bankruptcy of all those casinos down there. Uh, but, but uh, Hardeen, here was the announcement. There's going to be a big speech today about jobs in the economy. That's what it turned out to be. Uh, they, we're still waiting for a huge speech by Donald Trump about the economy. Well, there isn't going to be one. Um, you know, this, we're going to have to get used to this way of operating. He sort of says whatever comes into his head. He does take credit for other people's work. Look, this economy has done so much better because of a Barack Obama in the last eight years. There have been millions of jobs added. Uh, the unemployment rate has dropped dramatically. Wall Street is at a new high. None of that has anything to do with Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump may get in and do all kinds of wonderful things, and I hope he does, uh, that are good for the economy. Uh, so far, he's put in a whole bunch of people who screwed the very people who voted for Donald Trump. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, but sooner or later, this is the biggest job in the world. Sooner or later, what you do matters much more than what you say. And so he can say anything he wants to until January 20th. Then what he says really matters. Uh, and I don't think so far there's any indication it's going to match up with what he's done, which is nothing. But he, he does seem to have uh, figured out the minds of headline writers. He got some pretty good headlines today as a result of that, that little stunt. Uh, Reuters' uh, headline was, Trump says, sprint to bring 5,000 jobs back to U.S. L.A. Times had a headline up saying, Trump touts plan by Sprint and OneWeb to create 8,000 U.S. jobs. Uh, and Jonathan Gruber, this is uh, politics by headline. You know, look, the U.S. economy in a typical month both creates and destroys hundreds of thousands of jobs. And this is this kind of argument is exactly the argument by anecdote that Trump has mastered and that the press has bought into. We should be having these political debates over facts, over aggregate facts, jobs created, jobs lost, wages increasing, the enormous success that President Obama's created more jobs than any president in recent history, many more than Ronald Reagan, for example. That's the kind of fact we need to focus on, not the kind of anecdotes that Donald Trump uses over and over again to both promote his ideas and to attack constructive ideas on the other side. And uh, Howard Dean, the, the, the Trump plan as we know it for the economy so far, uh, the one thing that we are pretty clear on is a giant tax cut. And that may be the only thing you can bet on actually happening, because that's something the Republicans wanted to do before Donald Trump became a candidate for president. So the massive tax cut seems to be the one thing that we will see next year. First of all, Donald Trump actually said that he, Mike Pence was going to run a lot of the foreign and domestic affairs. And judging by the cabinet officials and how right wing they are, Mike Pence has had an outsized influence on all this. So it's most likely that what we're going to see is a rehash of the far-right tax cut proposals that we've seen in the past. The problem is Donald Trump was put in office by a lot of people who were struggling economically and wanted a change. What the change he's promising them is to give the billionaires of this country, like himself, a bigger tax cut and screw the working people by privatizing Social Security and Medicare. That's what is in Paul Ryan's plan. That's the plan the Republicans are looking at passing the House. So, uh, you know, whether whether we should save them from themselves or not is a matter of be, to be debated. 
But the Trump tax plan is, is first of all, absolutely worthless until we see what's actually in the legislature. And what we've seen by people who actually have votes, which Donald Trump does not until he, it gets to his desk, is not anything that's going to help middle class and working Americans in this country at all. Jonathan Gruber, based on everything we've heard uh, from Donald Trump about what he wants to do with taxes, about what we know Paul Ryan wants to do with taxes, what surprises might there be next year for the average Trump voter of average income uh, as a result of this tax bill? I think what's very interesting about what Trump's going to do is it's very much similar to what George Bush did, which was give an enormous tax cut that was vastly weighted towards the richest Americans, but came along with a small tax cut for most Americans. And so if you ask most Americans that George Bush give them a tax cut, they'll say, sure. And Trump's going to try and the Republicans are going to try the same thing. They're going to say facts like all Americans will get a tax cut or most of the people getting a tax cut earn less than $100,000. These are absolutely misleading facts. And real, the question for Democrats, I think is most important, is how do you break through that message? How do you explain, without sounding wonky, without sounding off-putting, that yes, the average American may get a couple hundred dollars back, but their kids are going to be paying thousands and thousands of dollars in higher interest charges because of the tax breaks going to the wealthiest Americans. That's the challenge for the Democratic Party is how to get that message through. Well, we happen to have someone from the Democratic Party with us. Howard Dean, how do they answer that? Well, first of all, I think we have to be, they have to look at the deficit. All these budget balancing groups in Washington, some of whom are really well funded by fairly conservative but mainstream Republicans, uh, they need to be going after the Republicans for the chicanery. First, if they use dynamic scoring, which is the only way they could even sh it can conceal the deficit, that's just lying and, and chicanery and, and financial BS. If a private company used that, they'd be out of business within two or three years. Uh, and some of them did do, use essentially some version of that in the private sector, and they are out of business as a result of what happened in 2008. So what we have to do is explain to people that running up more and more money on the, def on the deficit is not a way of helping America uh, become great again. We have to become the deficit hawks, ironically, because the one thing Reagan and the two Bushes had in common is they cut taxes and they cranked the deficit up dramatically because they never balanced the budget. They cut taxes without cutting programs. I don't think there's a lot of support in this country for cutting programs, including among those people who voted for Donald Trump. He's promised not to cut them. The only way he can cut taxes in that case is to crank up the deficit to some enormous amount of money. And we haven't talked about uh, the nuclear arms race he wants to put on or the infrastructure, which is even more money. Uh, you know, this is completely unrepublican to do this kind of stuff. The Democrats need to be deficit hawks. We need to talk about the deficit and get serious about it. And all those budget balancing groups in Washington funded by Republicans ought to be on our side because the Republicans are going to do nothing to make do anything better uh, about balancing the budget.